staying on here today after the tutorial at three o'clock. Um, just wanted to make sure everyone knew that was happening. Uh, there's a tutorial for Neil Marks at two o'clock. Um, for those of you, well, for everyone that's taking the exam, which is all first years plus any second year whose supervisor wants them to, um, the RF, the magnet, and the beam dynamics will be assessed this year. But it isn't it? It's not an exam. It's a take-home assessment, which will come out in January. Um, so it's worth going to tutorials. The three tutorials coincide to the three assessments, so it's worth our attending the tutorials. Um, I'll do my tutorial next week. There's a wee bit of homework out of the back, so if you can try and have a look at that beforehand, um, it'll help you when the assessment comes out if you've done the tutorial. So this is about RF, which um, you know to me is the most important part of the accelerator. The, the clue is in the title, acceleration. You know. And the RF does the acceleration, therefore, to me, it is the accelerator. Without that, it's just a bunch of magnets. Um, so um, we're going to talk about RF. So we're going to start with the very basics, and we'll build up slightly more advanced stuff later on. So very basics of acceleration is you have a charged particle, and you can accelerate by having two plates which have um, the same charge on... Uh, one plate and the opposite charge on another plate and you will have an electric field set up this is an electron i've done here uh, the electron will be accelerated towards the positive plate and repulsed by the negative plate so it will uh, be attracted across there it will accelerate as it does so that's the simplest type of accelerator electric static accelerators now this is very good for low energies you know you can get a you can get up to maybe 10 megavolt power supplies. The, the tower was, I think, 20 megavolts, uh, but it was a tandem, so it went twice through the same 10 megavolts. Um, but once you want to go past 10 MeV, you need bigger and bigger power supplies. And the breakdown strength um, of um, electric magnets, uh, sorry, electrostatic acceleration systems, um, the higher voltage it is, the lower gradient it'll break down at, so you need to bigger and bigger and bigger um, fields to get the same, to get higher gradients. And it ends up above 10 MeV. The system becomes so big and unwieldy, you just cannot build the system anymore. It would, it would grow far too fast. So here's a Van der Graaff, um, one of the 10 MeV type systems. This was what was in the tower. The tandem Van der Graaff is simply, you'll start off with, say, uh, minus ions, H minus, and you'll accelerate to 10 MeV, then you'll take the electrons off, so you're left with H plus, and you can accelerate again. It's 20 MeV, and that's kind of your limit. Um, there's an equation, the Kilpatrick criterion for electrostatics, that tells you um, what the how big a system you need for a given voltage. And as I say, the higher the voltage, it doesn't go linearly, it goes uh, a bit quadratically, so the... Um, if you double the voltage, it gets four times bigger, sort of thing. So you, you soon run out of space. The way around this was developed round about just before the war and, and by Ising and, and Woodrow and things, um, as you use a series of plates. So you can accelerate, say you have an electron here and this is positively charged, you accelerate to there. Now, at which point, to get accelerated more over here, if it was electrostatic, you would need to have another potential over here, which would be twice that potential, so it would get bigger and bigger. But Woodrow and Ising realised that what you could do was instead of having twice the potential over here, you could reverse the potential on the plates. So it would come across and it would be positively charged, then it would go negatively charged and it would repel it again. And you could keep on switching the polarity every time it passed one of the plates and you would get continuous acceleration. And in doing it that way, I'll show again, and doing it that way, by synchronizing the, the process, the, the movement of the charged particles to when you flip the polarity of the plates, you can continue to accelerate forever. And then your voltage goes with length. If you want to make it twice the voltage, you get twice the length. Um, so it becomes a lot easier to design and hold off. And this is how most if not all particle accelerators now work. Um, certainly when you get past 1 MeV nowadays, <laughs> there are some 10 MeV ion sources, but for certainly electrons and things like protons, 
you certainly wouldn't go above one MEV with, with, an, with an electrostatic system. You would go to the RF. And that's simply because you can reverse the polarity. A 10 megavolt generator can do 10 megavolts each jump, as opposed to, you know, three, three sections being 30 megavolts. So lower voltages. I mean, to do the LHC at 7 TV, you need a 7 terabolt power supply. It's just it's unfeasible. So RF is the way to go. So the first um, one of these was proposed by Ising in 1925 and built by Woodrow in 1928. Um, and then there's a, a slightly more modern version than the Alvarez version, which is used nowadays, which was developed in 1955. Um, the way uh, they, they do it is they have, and replacing the plates with these wee drift tubes, we call them. Um, and the beam comes along and it sees an accelerating potential in the gap and then um, it, it goes through the drift tube and it sees the other accelerating potential in the other gap. The, the way it works in the Woodrow Linac is that it always sees the same polarity in every gap so the, the drift tubes, it doesn't see any potential inside the drift tube. Um, it hides it from the electric fields such that it's inside the drift tube for exactly half a period. So it goes through an acceleration gap and then it's shielded and then when the field reverses back to being accelerating again it goes through the next gap and so on. Uh, and this is a system that works very well uh, with heavy irons and is still used today in most heavy iron and uh, high current proton machines uh, to accelerate. Um, the very simple RF system. The RF comes in from from this wee bit. I look at the bottom, fills the entire tank with a with an accelerating field, and it reverses with time. And you shield electrons in decelerating phase, and then it's in the gaps in accelerating phase, and it gets accelerated. As you notice, the gaps increase with length with distance. This is because the velocity of the particles increase with distance because it's being accelerated. So at the far end, the drift spaces are very long. And at the, at the the starting end, the drift spaces are very short because the, the particles aren't travelling very fast. So this was the first type. I'm not going to talk a lot about these in this lecture. You will see them next year when I do my advanced lectures in, uh, in Linux. But for introductory level, it's maybe a wee bit advanced. <coughs> what I'm going to talk more about is Cavity Linux, which is a similar idea apart from Instead of having one big tank with all the drift spaces in it, each gap is, a, is an isolated cavity. Um, so you can it's got walls all around it and you can fill it with RF and then they're connected via the drift spaces. Now this type of system works quite a lot better at higher velocity because you can independently phase each of the cavities. Um, they all have a dip, they can all be uh, connected separately with different phase shifts between them and you can operate it so that instead of having the drift space half a period long you can shorten that drift space to being a fraction of a wavelength um, so you can get a higher gradient if you like you don't have to have half the space being unused you can reduce that quite considerably because you can have any whenever the accelerating particle reaches here because it's independently phased you can have it at the optimum phase for every single cavity and this is what you tend to use at higher velocity particles. Electrons pretty much always use cavity Linux um, and protons at higher energy. Um, once they get to a couple of hundred MeV, we'll go straight into cavity Linux. So this is what I'm mainly going to talk about, these cavity Linux, through most of it. Now there's a number of parameters that we can characterise um, the RF cavities by. The most important is perhaps the, the Q factor or the Q naught, um, it's the ohmic Q factor. This is related, this is the ratio pretty much of the stored energy in the cavity to the losses in the cavity wall due to ohmic heating. When you have magnetic fields in a cavity and uses a current, that current flows in the walls, the wall have a resistance, therefore some of the power is lost as heat in the walls as you're driving a current through a resistance. So it's the ratio of the stored energy to the power and um, it's normalised to the cavity frequency 
um, so that it becomes unitless. Um, the stored energy is given by the integral of the magnetic field over the volume, or the magnetic field squared over the volume, um, and the Q factor, its definition, I'll only mean the ratio, is that it's 2 pi times the number of RF cycles it takes to dissipate the stored energy in the cavity. So if you've got a Q factor of 1,000, it takes 1,000, well, about 6,000 RF cycles to dissipate the energy in the cavity. Because it's an exponential decay, so it never really empties, it just gets less and less and less and less. But um, it roughly, it drops by a factor of um, roughly minus 1 when it's been 2 pi times the number of RF cycles. So the Q factor determines the maximum energy the cavity will fill to for a given input power. So if you put in this input power and you have this Q factor and this frequency, you'll get stored energy in the cavity. It's not exactly related to that. There's some other coupling uh, factors that come in there, but we'll see them in the next lecture. So the Q factor is quite important because it tells you how much energy in the cavity compared to the, the, the power in the cavity. And you want the Q factor to be as large as possible. So this is a, a cavity here. Essentially, it's like a waveguide, but it's got shorting plates on either wall um, so that the, the field is confined. You've got a standing wave in there because the wave is travelling towards this wall and gets reflected, comes to this wall, gets reflected, and the wave bounces backwards and forwards inside the cavity, creating a standing wave path. Um, if you superimpose um, all these plane waves by um, reflection inside the cavity surface, you get a cancellation of E perpendicular uh, parallel to the walls and B perpendicular to the walls, um, giving you a number of discrete cavity modes where these boundary conditions are met. And the boundary conditions, when they're met at that wall, gives you set number of modes in the cavity. What I mean by a mode is field patterns. There are set field patterns which are allowed because of the boundary conditions of having electric field, um, no parallel electric field and no perpendicular magnetic field, when you apply these boundary conditions, only certain mode patterns are allowed um, at discrete frequencies for each one. Typically for a, a, a rectangular cavity, the, the resonant frequency squared equals an integer times pi over um, the width and the x direction squared plus another integer times pi over the width and the b in the y direction squared, plus another integer p times pi over the length of the cavity squared, the length in the z direction. So for each of those integers, you get a different field pattern and a different resonant frequency, and we call that a mode of the cavity. So you could have, say, the 111 mode, for example, or the 213 mode or something. So each, each, integer, that's, each integer you could possibly think of gives you a different mode pattern. Um, zeros are allowed, but you can only have um, you can only have one zero at a time. So you can have the one one zero, or the one zero one, or the zero one one, but you can't have the zero zero one. So we don't tend to use rectangular cavities. We tend to use cylindrical cavities because they give us slightly less losses, higher Q factors, um, and it's easier for some of the dynamics aspects as well to deal with cylindrical cavities. Um, the wave equation of cylindrical coordinates, for those of you who don't know it, ends up looking like this. The wave equation is your um, del EZ plus K EZ equals zero. Um, so in cylindrical coordinates, it ends up being expanded like this. <clears throat> so we then take um, the solution to this equation as a, uh, some constant times a Bessel function um, of the first kind of order m uh, with, with the subscript with the um, this being a function of the cutoff wave number, which is related to the resonant frequency in the cavity, times the radial um, position times the exponential of i m thigh. That m there, you remember when we talked about mode orders, there was an integer m, um, and that's that integer m here and here. Um, so you end up that when you try and solve this equation here, I've used this thigh here, but I haven't said that thigh is yet. Now, you end up with two sets of solutions. You can start off by assuming that thigh 
is the longitude and electric field, and you end up with uh, one set of equations, or you could apply that phi is the longitudinal magnetic field, and you end up with a different set of equations. You could also start with transverse in there. Equations would look slightly different in the end. You would get you would get an accurate solution, but by convention, we expand in the z direction. So, if you started off with phi equals hz, you get what's known as a transverse electric mode. And if you started off with ez as phi, you get something known as a transverse magnetic mode. A transverse electric mode can only have hz finite. It can't have ez being finite at the same time. And the opposite goes for the transverse magnetic mode. ez can be finite, but hz cannot be finite. It must be zero. Um, there are cavity shapes where you can get EZ and HZ at the same time, but they are slightly more complex cavities. We tend to deal with a pillbox shape where you've got either uh, transverse electric or transverse magnetic fields. So the, when you expand in terms of EZ or HZ, you get a term for H transverse and E transverse. So you end up with your three dimensions of field at all points in space. So um, we have our TM and our T, T, uh, TM and T modes. Now, you notice the radial function was a Bessel function. That, rather than being sinusoidal in radius, <laughs> it was a Bessel function in radius. Now, our boundary conditions, as we saw for the, the square cavity, was that the electric field must be zero uh, parallel to the walls. So for the TM uh, modes, if the EZ field varies as a Bessel function, we know that EZ must be zero at the walls, otherwise you would, ha you would violate that boundary condition. So we can only have the, the Bessel function must equal zero at those walls, therefore um, the Bessel function's um, exponents I think, um, should be equal to one of the values where it equals zero, so two point something have the exact value or 3.9 or around about 5-ish, anytime it equals zero you're in a loud mode. So it was like with the rectangular cavities when your sinusoidal heart equals zero so you end up with factors of m pi over 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 a and m, n pi over b. It's like that with the Bessel functions apart from it's not integers these m, n, and p's are, they are whatever the roots of the Bessel functions are. So to work out what, how many modes there are, you have to look at the roots of the Bessel function to work it out. For the TE mode, it's the same, but it's the um, it's the differential of the Bessel function that needs to go to zero. So you have to look at the the, the zeros of the the roots of the differential Bessel function. So you end up with a number of cavity modes. Um, now the M, N, and P, instead of being X, Y, and Z, they now become Thi, R, and Z. I've missed the Z exponent here because I'm looking at the waveguide modes for now. But um, So it's, it's Thi and R exponents. So the T, E, 0, 1 means there are zero variations azimuthally, but there is one radial variation. So for example, this one here would start off as a maximum, go to zero, go to a maximum radially, if you go around azimuthally, there is no change. The T11 mode has one azimuthal variation, one radial variation. So if you go around this way, it changes by 360 degrees as you go around 360 degrees. And it goes from minima, maxima, minima, radially. And then you have the same for the TM mode. You get TM01 and the, say here we've got the T21. It has two azimuthal variations, so it goes uh, maxima, zero, minima, zero, maxima, zero, minima, zero, going around azimuthally. So it changes by four pi as you go around by 360 degrees, and radially it has one variation, and so on. Uh, I think I've got this round the wrong way. That should be T phi r, not r phi. I'll change that for next, for next year. So, it says here, m is the number of full wave variations around theta, n is the number of half wave variations around the diameter, and p is the number of half wave variations along the length. So when you see a mode in this, it tells you how many wave variations 
Now this is quite important because there are, there are an infinite number of modes in a cavity. But you're not going to use all of them, you're going to use one mode. So you will select the mode you want to use based on its field pattern. Some modes accelerate the beam, some modes deflect the beam, some modes will act like quadrupole magnets and will focus the beam, some will act like sextuple magnets and screw up the chromaticity, and so on. You get octopole, decapole, so on, uh, in terms of these modes of the cavity. And they will all interact with the beam. You'll only want it to interact with one, but it will interact with them all. And you'll have some effects in your, you'll, you'll lose some of your beam. The quality of your beam is your emittance loss always goes up because of these other modes. So it's important that you know the difference between the different modes and how, how they're named and things. So the one you are most likely to be using, not always, but most likely to be using to accelerate, is the TM010 mode. Now, in cylindrical coordinates you can have two zeros. It's only, radio, it's only in Cartesian coordinates you can only have one zero. So um, it has zero azimuthal variation. So you can see if you go, this is the magnetic field. As you go around azimuthally, there's no variation. It has one radial variation. So this is at longitudinally. You can see it goes from zero maxima zero. So it's got one radial variation. And it has zero longitudinal variation. You can see it doesn't vary longitudinally. Now this is a, a perfect mode to accelerate with. It has a large longitudinal electric field to accelerate in the centre. It has no magnetic field in the centre. And it's a lower order mode, i.e. it doesn't have a lot of complex variations in it. The, the higher order mode you go to, it tends to use, it's not quite as good a cavity. Some of your cavity parameters don't perform quite as well. So you want to operate at the lowest mode you can. Also, the frequency is quite good because it's the first mode in the cavity. If you have a, a well-designed pillbox cavity, the first resonant mode is this mode. So you have no modes below it, you only have modes above it, which gives you certain advantages in dealing with those other modes that you can put a high-pass uh, high filter on some sort of coupler and you can take out all the other modes without taking out this one. So um, it's the best mode to use by far. And this is the one that most people will use. There's a couple of examples where you don't use it, but 95% of the cases you're going to be using this mode. So this is the field of the TM010. We call it a monopole mode because it looks a bit like a monopole. It look, you know, if you put a bunch of charge, positive charge there, it would look a bit like this. So we call it a monopole mode. There is one pole, if you like. Um, so the EZ field is some constant E0 times a uh, Bessel function of the zeroth kind times 2.405, that's the root of the first Bessel function, times the radius radial position, sorry, divided by the radius of the cavity. And that varies exponentially in time. Ez equals zero, hr equals zero, h thai is minus i over what we could dead not, it's the impedance of three space, equals 3770 ohms, it's down here. Just a fundamental constant. And times that e naught constant, again, times the Bessel function of the first kind, 2.405 r over r, e thai equals zero, er equals zero. So it's a very simple cavity, there's only two um, mode indices in it. So this is the standing wave in the cavity. You can see it varies with time and the electric field goes forwards and backwards. Clearly you would want the electron to come into the cavity when it's accelerating it and leave the cavity before it starts to decelerate it. Um, if your cavity was too long your electron didn't get out by the time the field reversed it would start to be decelerated and if your cavity was twice as long as it should be, you get no net acceleration. So you have to carefully design the length of the structure so that it only accelerates, it doesn't decelerate. Now, here we have to move away from conventional definitions of things like voltage. The voltage is, um, if you take your fields and you integrate um, along a path between A and B, uh, the electric field, you would get the voltage, and that's a traditional definition of voltage. So here's the EZ field here uh, inside the cavity with longitudinal position Z. If you integrated that, you would get the traditional definition of a voltage. But that's completely useless to accelerators because we don't care about what the DC voltage is, we care about the acceleration of a particle. And the problem is the particle takes a set amount of time to get from A to B. 
It doesn't move instantaneously, it moves at a velocity, normally the speed of light, or at least beta times the speed of light, so it can be slightly slower for some ions. Um, so the, t the electric field in the cavity actually varies as the particle is moving through it. So the, the particle never sees the full voltage of the cavity, it sees some reduction in that cavity voltage. So this is EZ at t equals zero, this red line here is the EZ field seen by the charged particle, for example. So you can see the integral under this red shape is much less than the integral under this red shape because it, the fields are varying as it moves through there. When it comes into the cavity, the fields are low, and when it leaves the cavity, the fields are low, so it sees a bit less. The blue line is what you would see with a 90 degree phase shift. So um, there's a phase associated with the electrons enter the cavity or the particles into the cavity. And it can either be an accelerating phase or it could be in a sort of bunching phase. Um, and different cavities work at different points. Sometimes you just want the most acceleration possible. We call that uncrest. Or you can be off crest in something like a synchrotron to give you more bunching to keep your bunch together a bit better. And, uh, you know, for the LHC, it operates more <laughs> close to this blue line. But for Alice and Clara, we're much closer to the red line. So the accelerating voltage, or the, the energy gained by the particle, is given by the integral of the electric field with dz, as you would expect. There's also this additional term in here, the exponential of i omega z over c. Now, the, we saw previously that the fields in the cavity varied with the exponential of i uh, minus i omega t. Um, so it's got time in there. Now, we know the particle's velocity, or this is at least for a, for a relative, fully relativistic particle, the velocity is the speed of light c. So therefore, time and position are correlated by the velocity, so that time equals distance over velocity. So if we substitute time in there to distance over velocity, we have a function of z to match the function of z in the cavity. Therefore, we can integrate with respect to z and see the actual accelerating motion of the cavity. There's still a t in there, but the t represents the phase at which it enters the cavity now. Um, and it ends up, for the maximum kick possible, maximum acceleration possible, the, cam the particle should traverse the cavity in half an RF period. Sometimes you go less than that for various reasons. Um, very rarely you go more than that. So for a fully relativistic particle, the length of each cavity should be roughly speed of light divided by two times the frequency. Roughly. So we tend to denote this, the ratio of the um, energy gain of the particles um, to the energy gain you would get in a DC system, which is E0 times L, is given by something known as the transit time factor. It's the amount the voltage is reduced due to the fact that the, the fields are varying in time and the particle takes a finite amount of time to get between A and B. So the, the energy gain of a particle going through the cavity is the gradient E0, which is uh, how many megavolts per meter the field is, times the length of the cavity times this transit time factor. Um, and for a pillbox cavity, um, where the, the fields are constant inside of it, um, apart from the time variation factor, you get the ratio of the energy gained by the particles to the energy gain of a normal system is given by sine pi times the gap. So it's, it's like the length, but you might the length and the gap might be slightly different um, for various reasons. Divided by the, the beta, that's v over c, velocity of the particle times the wavelength, over pi g over beta over lambda. So it ends up looking a bit like this. So this is the gap divided by the um, beta over lambda. Uh, and you can see that if the particle was infinitely short, the transit time factor would be 1. But as the cavity gets longer, the transit time factor drops. And if the cavity was, if for a fully relativistic particle, if the gap was one wavelength long, you would get zero acceleration. Because it would be in the cavity for one full acceleration half cycle and one full decelerating half cycle. So the two would cancel. So ideally, you tend to want to be about here. You don't want to be here because it's L times T as your acceleration. 
So if it was infinitely small, the gain would be infinitely small. You would have no acceleration. So you want to have it long enough to get some acceleration, but short enough that your transit time factor isn't tiny. So round about 0 0.5 is about perfect. You get a transit time factor of about 0.8-ish, 0.7-ish. Um, but your length's long enough to get some appreciable acceleration. <coughs> Sometimes you won't operate at the maximum voltage, as I said, um, on crest. You won't try to get the maximum acceleration you can. This is because um, when you have a longitudinal dynamics and you have a bunch of a finite size, if you accelerate on the crest, electrons in the center will get an acceleration gradient, but either side of it will see slightly less voltage. And over time, they'll have different energies and the magnets will focus them differently and you'll end up with an emittance growth of the machine, or at least a growth in the beam. If you go slightly off crest, you can have it that particles at the end of the beam get more acceleration and particles at the front of the beam get less acceleration and therefore your bunch gets compressed in time. Um, so you can get some additional bunching, sort of longitudinal focusing by moving slightly off crest. Now in this case, um, the cavity voltage VC and the voltage the beam sees are reduced by a factor of cosine times the phase at which you want to operate at. Um, for most Linux, you'll operate, or most electron Linux, you'll operate, operate at phi equals zero on crest. But for synchrotrons, proton synchrotrons, you'll tend to be further down from that. As I say, for the LHC, this is something close to about 80 degrees, I think. So the cavity voltage and the beam voltage aren't identical as well. You can sometimes reduce it to get a bit more bunching. So um, this is for the TM010 mode. Your voltage is the real part of the integral. Um, and I've expanded it out and you get something in the order of the voltage equals E0 times 2 sine omega L over 2 C over omega over C. Um, and when L equals C over 2 F, um, you get something on the order of this. E0 times the cosine of the phase times 2 over pi times L. For a half wavelength cavity, for a fully relativistic particle, the transit time factor is 2 over pi. <coughs> but it's not just about voltage and Q factor. We also care about the peak surface fields because there are a number of um, things that can limit the maximum voltage you can put in your cavity. It's not just, I'll get a big power supply and we'll accelerate to one terabolt per meter and the LHC will be this size. It, it doesn't quite work that way because there's limits to the maximum gradient a cavity can see. One of those is power um, from your klystron, but a more fundamental limit tends to be your, your peak surface fields. There are a number of effects, which we'll see in the third lecture, that relate to this. The, the main one is something known as breakdown. That in your cavity, um, it's in vacuum, but you end up that if you have a high enough acceleration gradient on your surface, you'll be able to pull electrons out of the metal, because your metal's got few electrons in it. They have a work function, which keeps them confined, confined in the metal. If your accelerating gradient is high enough that it can overcome the work function, then electrons will be pulled out of the cavity and you'll get what we call field emission. That field emission heats up the cavity and then the cavity surface vaporizes locally. Then that can be ionized by the electrons and you get a plasma in your cavity. That's known as breakdown. And that happens when your maximum surface field gets too high. So typically we want to look at the ratio of E max to E acceleration i.e. the maximum surface field to the accelerating gradient. And we want that to be as small as possible. We want to have as small a surface field as we can for a given accelerating gradient. Accelerating gradient being uh, voltage over length. It's your average acceleration. So if you had a 10 meter structure, you multiply that by the accelerating gradient to get your voltage. Um, and for a pillbox cavity, that ratio is pi over two. Now, it's not just the electric field that matters, it's also the magnetic field. The magnetic field can give you heating, but not just normal heating, it can give you something known as pulse heating. That what you're doing with the magnetic field is you're inducing induction heating on the, on the cavity surface. 
Now, when you have a pulsed RF system, that heat is only applied for a fraction of a second, maybe a microsecond. Now, in that time, the heat cannot propagate all the way through the cavity. It will only heat maybe the first couple of microns of the surface of the cavity. So, the temperature you get from a given stored energy going into the cavity is proportional to the volume you're heating. And if you're only heating a micron out of the surface, you've got a small volume, but a big stored energy. So you get temperature spikes on short time scales. That's known as pulse heating. So for that reason, you also don't want to have your magnetic field being very high either. So you've also got H max over the acceleration, and that's about 2430 amps per meter over megavolts per meter for a power box cavity. Now, in a real accelerator, we'll have more complex shapes, something like this. Um, this is the accelerating field, and you can see you're getting spikes round about the apertures. So the power box cavity is your best case, but for real cavities, it's usually a lot worse than that um, by a factor of two or more. So when you're trying to design your cavity, you want to minimize these two numbers. Um, as well as that, you've got your surface resistance. Um, we talked about it when we mentioned Q earlier on, that you've got a magnetic field on the wall, and that induces a surface current uh, in your wall, um, because the, the, when you have a, a magnetic field, a, a time-varying magnetic field on a conductor, because a time-varying magnetic field induces a time-varying electric field, um, you cannot have electric fields inside a conductor. So a current flows inside the conductor to shield the electric field and hence the magnetic field. So you have currents flowing inside your conductor. Oops, went too far. Um, now the current can penetrate a wee bit into the surface because it's not a perfect conductor, it has a finite conductivity. So the amount it can penetrate into the, into the, into the surface is given by what's known as the skin depth, just square root of two over the conductivity times the resonant frequency times the permeability, which is round about one for copper. Um, and then this leads to a resistance of that surface, surface resistance of one over the conductivity times the skin depth. So you end up that the you've got a current flowing in that resistance and that generates heat. The conduct one over the conductivity of copper is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 8 ohms ohm meters. So this leads to power dissipation. Your power dissipation in your cavity walls is given by half of the surface resistance, half because it's AC, so it's of an RMS value, <laughs> times the integral of the magnetic field squared over the surface. So you can see you want to minimise your surface magnetic field to minimise the heating a wee bit. Um, so you, you end up you get power loss in the cavity walls. Now, all that energy that goes into the cavity walls must be dissipated somehow. Energy can't be created to destroy, so it turns into heat. So your cavity starts to heat up, and then you don't want it to melt, so you've got to cool that down somehow. Um, for normal conducting cavities, you can put maybe a megawatt into it and cool it effectively. Um, pulse systems can go much higher, obviously, because the, the energy in the pulse system is reduced. For superconducting cavities, you don't want to put more than a watt or two into it. Now, we can represent this cavity in circuit theory. Um, typically, you, your cavity has two plates on it, um, acting like a capacitor. You have an electric field going across a gap. So you, you have a capacitance across the, the two plates. The current is flowing around the walls. When you've got a charge on either side, the current tries to flow around the walls to so I cancel out any charge and balance. So that acts like an inductor because you've got a current going around in a curved path. So you have a capacitance and inductance in your circuit. And then you've got your resistance in there as well. This, isn't, this resistance in this circuit isn't your cavity surface resistance. It's something else we call the shunt impedance because you have a given voltage across the capacitor um, and it's a ratio of that voltage to the power loss in the walls. Um, so... The surface resistance is the ratio of the, the, the voltage in the walls, but now we have the ratio of the voltage across the capacitance, the cavity voltage in here. So we have to find a new resistance, which we call the shunt impedance. So it's not our surface, it's known as our shunt. Um, and we'll look at that in a minute. So with this equivalent circuit, 
the stored energy is 1 over the square root of LC. The power is voltage squared over 2R. Here that's this shunt impedance. So we could rearrange this to get the shunt impedance as the ratio of the voltage to the power lost. Now that's very useful because what we want is we want to maximise the voltage while minimising the power loss in the walls. So this is the exact number we need to optimise this R value. Very important. Um, the stored energy is half CV squared. So it's like a normal circuit in here. The only difference is when you're dealing with normal circuits, you don't get a transit time factor. So you have to remember at the end to include the transit time factor everywhere. So you ended up with this shunt impedance. Very useful quantity because it gives you the ratio of the voltage squared to the power loss in the walls. Sometimes there's a factor of a half in there, sometimes there isn't. It depends on, because an AC system, now, as an electrical engineer, I would quite like to use the RMS voltage divided by the, the, the power loss in the cavity walls, RMS. But, of course, the, the beam doesn't see a time varying field. The beam sees E voltage. So you could consider using the beam voltage divided by the, the power loss in the walls, in which case you wouldn't have the factor of a half. So it really depends on whether you're looking at it as an accelerator physicist or, or an electrical engineer, whether you use the factor of a half or not. The problem is, some people use it, sometimes people don't, and they don't always tell you which version they've used. So be very careful when you see shunt impedance somewhere, that you've got that factor of a half in there. In fact, design, when designing Alice, that mistake happened on the buncher cavity. The RF group were using electrical engineering definitions, the accelerator group were using um, accelerator physics definitions, and the system was specified incorrectly. It was fixed in the end, it wasn't a big problem. But it's something that happens all the time in accelerator physics. The, the ACFIS group and the RF group in every lab around the world sometimes use different units for shunt impedance and for voltage as well, actually. So you have to be very careful. Um, so shunt impedance is, is a critical quantity that has to be optimised for. <coughs> for a pillbox cavity, the shunt impedance can be given by the, the power loss in the walls, which is a half R times H squared. We can substitute in the definition of H squared into that. We end up with two terms. We have the end plates have some losses on them, and the outer wall has a loss on it. So we get two terms, and we can add these together to get the power lost. And then we have the voltage equation in there. So we can then, the shunt means is the, the voltage squared divided by the power lost. We end up with this equation. And for a cavity that's a half wavelength long, we get 5 times 10 to the 4 over the surface resistance. Now you'll notice that shunt beans is proportional to surface resistance. So it's a property of both the cavity and the material you make it from. Um, some people do RS times R surface, so that it's independent of the cavity uh, material. Another way of looking at it is the geometric shunt beans. We've seen the Q factor at the start. That's important for any cavity resonator. If you take the shunt impedance and you divide it by the Q factor, you get the voltage squared over 2 omega U. So it's the ratio of the voltage to the stored energy. And this becomes important. We'll see this in my last lecture because this is the quantity that um, tells you how the beam interacts with the cavity um, in terms of beam loading and weight fields. Um, so all the other modes apart from the TM010 interact with the cavity and they interact at an amplitude proportional to the R upon Q. So this is an important quantity as well we'll look at. And we need to calculate the R upon Q not just for the operating mode but for all the modes above it as well. Um, there's an infinite number of modes but we can truncate it quite heavily down to about 200 modes. <coughs> and the R upon Q can be given by the stored energy which is a half mu naught h squared giving us this function for a pillbox, uh, and the voltage again giving us 150 times the length of the cavity divided by, by the surface resistance. No, it shouldn't be surface resistance, sorry, R. Oh, the radius, that is. So it's 150 times the length over the radius, which is roughly, for a half wavelength long cavity, 196 ohms. It will be worse than that for a real cavity, but for, for a pillbox, 196 ohms. Now, another, the last quantity I want to talk about is the geometry factor. Now, because Q0 is proportional to the power loss in the cavity walls, it's also proportional to the material you make your cavity from. 
And supplier to supplier, you may get a different surface resistance. So when you're designing your cavity, rather than just assume a surface resistance, sometimes you take uh, something known as the geometry factor, which is Q0 times the surface resistance, which gives you a factor which is independent of the surface resistance. And therefore, it's a property just to do with the cavity geometry. It allows you to compare superconducting, normal conducting cavities or cavities from different suppliers. Um, so it's a useful thing to know. Um, because it's frequency, it's the Q factor is frequency dependent as the surface resistance is frequency dependent. Um, so it also allows you to scale between frequencies. And the Q factor in a pill box is the stored energy which we saw previously when we calculated the shunt impedance. Stored energy we got when we calculated the upon Q. So Q naught is omega U over P. So we can stick that and that into there. And we are left with something about 260. We can also get these factors from this equivalent circuit a lot easier because if we know L, R and C, the Q0 is just the square root of C over L times R and then R upon Q is either 1 over omega C or square root L over C. So the equivalent circuit can get you the same things with a bit less maths. The equivalent circuits are very useful because you can find if you were modeling a dynamic system with a changing power or some beam loading or some vibration data in there um, or a beam that was changing with time, doing it with a full, solving Maxwell equations fully would take you a very long time. You need a supercomputer and a lot of time to, to solve dynamic equations. By using this equivalent circuits, we can start to look at dynamic systems a lot faster just by solving Kirchhoff's laws and Kirchhoff's laws are much easier to solve than Maxwell's equations, primarily because they're one dimension and Maxwell's equations are three dimensional. So I've mainly looked at the pill box so far, but it's the pill box is just a simple case. A pill box can never be used for a real accelerator because the beam needs to get into the cavity and out of the cavity. So we need to add holes to get the beam in and out. And this causes some problems here. So here is the beam aperture. And this is the shunt impedance. This was a study done by Slack uh, for different frequency cavities. And you can see the shunt impedance drops as a function of the, the beam aperture. You find, well, this is shunt impedance per unit meter, actually, which is a different way of looking at it. You find if you had an infinitely small aperture, you'd always want to go to the highest frequency possible, which is why click we're looking at C K band, which is 30 gigahertz, and X band, mm -hmm. which, is, which is 12 gigahertz. But as your aperture gets bigger and bigger, you start to get, lose some of that advantage you initially had from uh, going to higher frequency. Um, because the aperture becomes a bigger fraction of the wavelength and you get higher peak fields and you get lower accelerating gradients. So for a real cavity, you've always got to worry about the aperture. And also the shape of the aperture, you can add these re-entrant sections in here which will give you a higher shunt impedance but a lower peak field, eh, sorry, higher shunt impedance and higher peak field at the same time. So um, it's always a trade-off. So it's a lot more complicated than this for a real cavity. There's a lot of effort in designing a cavity to, to minimise all those quantities um, where appropriate. Uh, and obviously getting the beam in and out uh, is a problem as well. So you couldn't go for a tiny aperture because although the beam has a tiny size, it can jitter about in time and you'll start to lose some of your beam and you get other issues such as weight fields. So you've always got to start off with what aperture you're allowed from the beam dynamics, and then that can tell you quite quickly what your cavity is going to look like. So lastly, frequency scaling. So all these quantities have frequency variations. The surface resistance scales as the square root of frequency for normal conducting systems or frequency squared for superconducting systems. The frequency squared thing is a bit of a problem because for superconducting systems, if you wanted to go to something like X-band, the system would be far too lossy. Superconducting systems can't really go above 3 gigahertz. Whereas for normal conducting systems, um, well, lower frequencies are better, they're not much better. And in fact, when you consider some other fa factors, they actually get a bit worse, which I'll we'll look at in the next slide. The Q factor obviously goes as the inverse of these two. Um, the Shunt impedance also goes to the inverse of these. So you can see, again, you want the lower frequency as possible for a single cell at least. And R upon Q doesn't have any frequency dependence. That's why R upon Q is also so handy. It has no frequency dependence. 
So, last bit, multi-cell cavities. Now, when you have a cavity, actually for a single cell cavity, the most expensive element by about an order of magnitude isn't the cavity itself, it's the coupler. The coupler systems are always quite complex and they end up costing quite a bit. So clearly, if the couple is the most expensive thing by an order of magnitude, would it not make sense to couple the cavities together and only have one coupler for every 10, 20, 30 cavities? And that's what we do. Um, there's other reasons as well for doing it, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, so typically most machines will have one coupler for a, a large number of cavities. Some have two couplers for travelling wave structures, some have one coupler. Um, and, and that makes things a bit cheaper. The coupler also takes up space. Um, they have a shared vacuum, so you need one set of vacuum pumps as well, <coughs> one set of cooling, because couplers are a good conductor, you don't have to cool everywhere. So you end up, your costs and your space reduces significantly if you put a lot of cavities together with one coupler. Um, so when you do this, your shunt impedance goes up because shunt impedance is the ratio of voltage squared to the power lost. If you double your number of cavities, your voltage doubles and your power loss doubles. But your shunt impedance is voltage squared divided by power loss. So your shunt impedance also doubles. So your shunt impedance for a multi-cell structure is the shunt impedance of a single cavity times the number of cells. Roughly. It varies a wee bit. But it's roughly um, times the number of cells. So your shunt impedance, which is a critical parameter, increases as you increase your number of cells. It doesn't, it's not quite as good as this, because although your shunt impedance increases, your shunt impedance isn't gradient, it's voltage. So as you would expect, if your cavity is twice as long, your voltage doubles. So it's not quite as good as it sounds. But certainly you can get a higher voltage for a given power. And you can play about with in terms of gradient. Um, you have to do the full calculations for the exact structure. Sometimes you're better off, sometimes you're not. They're usually an optimum for the number of cells. But you then lose the ability to independently synchronize your uh, cavities. So to get the, the beam phased, we have to deal with something known as a synchronous phase, which is the, the phase at which the cavity enters the next cell is the phase that it entered the previous cell plus a factor of omega over L over beta C, which is a transit to the amount of time it takes to phase it changes by when it goes from one cell to the next, plus this function here, theta A. Theta A is the phase advance. Now, the cavities don't necessarily all have to be at the same phase at the same time. You can have phase differences between your cavities. And for most accelerating structures, we will either use, for standing wave structures, we'll use pi as your phase advance, so each cell will reverse its phase every second cell. Or for traveling wave structures, you have something like 2 pi over 3 or 5 pi over 6. So then your length between your two cells to get optimum acceleration is the phase advance times beta over c divided by the frequency. So we typically use pi in there. So you end up, and if you're fully resisting that equals 1, you end up the length should be pi times c over omega, <coughs> which ends up being half a wavelength. If you go for a different phase advance, the length varies. So if you wanted a phase advance of pi over 2, your length would reduce by a factor of a half, and so on. Um, so synchronous phase is the phase at which you get the, the most acceleration. For higher order modes, the same thing happens. For a higher order mode, each higher mode has a range of phase advances going between 0 and 2 pi. So the, the higher order mode that interacts most with the beam is the one where the length of the cavity and the frequency give you 